Okay, welcome. I'm going to get started. Um, so my name is Kristen Lilliman, and I'm an engagement specialist with Dylan Consulting, and I'll be the third party facilitator for uh, this evening's meeting, I guess it's evening. Um, so Dylan has been working with the City of St. Catharines on the Waterfront Access Master Plan, and we are all as a project team looking forward to the discussion today at the meeting. Um, note that this is meeting. This meeting is being recorded, um, so you may have heard that that notification. And the presentation component of of today's session will be posted on the city's YouTube page. So I will begin today um, with a land acknowledgement. The city of St. Catharines in Niagara Region is the traditional home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. The land is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe peoples, many of whom continue to live and work here today. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties and is within the land protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. Today, this gathering plays its home to many First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples, and acknowledging this uh, reminds us of our great standard of living is directly related to the resources and friendships of Indigenous peoples. Today, we are focused, our conversation will be on the waterfront. So it is, I think, it's really important also to, to understand and recognize that Indigenous peoples and particularly Indigenous women have a sacred relationship with water as the giver of life and the lifeblood of communities. As part of the Waterfront Access Management Plan, there is ongoing effort to engage Indigenous rights holders in this project, which I'll talk more about later on in the presentation. So I'm going to go through the agenda for today. Um, so we'll start with some uh, welcoming remarks and introductions to who is here with us today from the project team. There will be a presentation on the waterfront context, including um, the, the policy context and previous background studies, as well as the purpose of the waterfront access master plan. And then we'll go through some of the initial uh, waterfront access analysis. Um, so including outlining some existing points along Lake Ontario, um, such as the beaches, parks, lookouts, um, will then provide an overview of the community and stakeholder engagement approach, um, including a high level uh, overview of what we've heard to date. So a summary of some of the feedback we've received and some of the key themes that that have emerged. Um, there will be opportunities for engagement, as you can see on this on this uh, agenda, there are engagement moments kind of sprinkled in throughout the meeting. And so there'll be opportunities to have your say and to provide input through polling questions. So we're going to be using um, uh, an application called uh, Mentimeter, and we're going to have some time for Q&A and also a workshop um, to hear your feedback as well. We'll wrap up with some next steps and we'll aim to close this meeting by, by 7 p.m. So now just a few introductions of who is in the meeting today. So we are joined by those at the city who are leading the master planning plan, including Jocelyn St. Denis, uh, Anthony Mar Marchuccio, and Eric Lamoth. We also have members of our consulting team with us today, including myself, um, Kristen Lilliman, along with Martina Bronstein and Jason Ariola from Dillon Consulting. I will now ask Jocelyn um, if you wanted to provide any welcoming remarks so before we get into the presentation. You can you can do so now. Uh, yeah, I'd just like to welcome everyone. Um, thank you for attending this PIC. Uh, the city is looking forward to hearing what the general public's uh, comments are in regards, and we, we look forward to getting your feedback. Uh, in regards to what you would like to see uh, with our waterfront. So thank you very much. Thanks, Jocelyn. Um, so just a bit of housekeeping. So you will be muted during the presentation. Um, if you do have a question or comment, you can use the raise hand function or type your question into the chat box. Um, that should be available for you now. Um, the chat will be open throughout the meeting. So we encourage you to add to the discussion and put in any questions as, as we go through then, but there are there is a dedicated Q&A period um, at the end of the technical presentation to address questions. If you are going to raise your hand, please introduce yourself before asking a question. Um, my role uh, today is as meeting facilitator. 
my job is really to manage the discussion and make sure everyone gets a chance to be heard. If you don't get your question answered live today, you can reach out to Jocelyn following this meeting and we will provide her her contact information. So just a few other notes on uh, the code of conduct. So we welcome questions and discussion. There are no bad questions. Um, I always say if you are thinking of a question, likely someone else's as well. We do want to hear from everyone and believe that everyone has wisdom and experience to share. And, and with that in mind, being, being respectful and listening. So there will likely be differences in opinion, but everyone deserves to be heard. The city is here today to listen to your feed, feedback, your thoughts, your perspectives. So please participate through the various engagement moments throughout the meeting today. With that in mind, um, I invite you to join our Mentimeter live polling that we'll be um, using throughout the meeting today. You can use um, your smartphone and scan the QR code um, that you see on the screen there and to access the questions, or you can um, go to menti.com and enter in the uh, code that's on the screen there, which is, um, uh, six five eight eight seven six six four. So while everyone gets that um, gets that going, uh, I will. I will go to um, our first Mentimeter question, just as a warm up. And Jason, if you don't mind putting in the, the menti.com, oh, you already did, great. I see you have put it in there. So the code and the, the address for the website is already in there. Um, but our first question, is um, how do you often do you typically access the waterfront? We have a couple um, responses here, a um, couple options for you to consider. I'll give it a, a few moments here for people to join uh, Mentimeter and provide your response. But so far we do have one person who accesses the waterfront frequently which is not surprising given, given the topic of today's conversation. So you can just go to menti.com. You can do this from your desktop browser as well. It doesn't have to be from your smartphone. Um, and then the code is 65887664. Um, but for now, maybe I will um, get back to the presentation and while well, responses uh, come in, I can hand it over to, to Jocelyn once I get the presentation slides. Okay, Jocelyn, you can um, you can go ahead now and we'll go to the next slides and you can provide the overview and the context and the, the purpose of, of the Waterfront Access Master Plan. Great. Thanks, Kristen. Um, yeah, so we can just go to the next slide. So, I'll, yeah, I'll be, uh, as Kristen said, I'll be uh, discussing kind of the context um, of this and the purpose of for why the city is uh, completing this uh, waterfront access master plan. Uh, so this slide, um, it shows uh, all the properties that the city owns uh, along the waterfront. So the waterfront from uh, the Western municipal boundary to the Eastern municipal boundary for St. Catharines, uh, the total length of the waterfront is actually 11 and a half kilometers. And of that uh, distance, the city does own approximately 4.8 kilometers. Um, in addition, we do have uh, leases uh, that we are laying and that we lease from the federal government, uh, specifically for the George Nicholson Memorial Trail. 
Um, so the city's properties, they range from beaches, parks, trails, and right-of-ways. And so you can, uh, all the uh, orange uh, lines along uh, this map shows the actual uh, waterfront properties that the city does own. Uh, so we can go to the next slide. So there's many different policies and background studies that uh, have been completed by both the region and the city that discuss the city's waterfront. Um, so over the next few slides, uh, we'll kind of summarize some of the key takeaways from some of these policies and studies. So the first uh, study that uh, we are that we're uh, kind of highlighting is the uh, Niagara official plan, which was completed in 2022. The region's official plan discusses promoting good stewardship practices for publicly accessible parkland and open spaces, as well as recommends that municipalities develop master plans to uh, strategically and equitably plan for use and management of publicly accessible parks, open spaces, and trails. Uh, which includes shorelines, uh, to best serve the needs of all local residents. It also promotes visual and physical access at waterfronts, as well as where feasible, create a continuous waterfront feature by connecting publicly accessible waterfront. And then uh, the next uh, the next study is the city's official plan, which was developed in 2010. And since then, there have been various amendments um, similar to the region's official plan, it also recommends an interconnected and safe open space network and creating a continuous trail system along Lake Ontario waterfront by acquiring land as development occurs. And then there's also the recreation facility and programming master plan that the city completed. Uh, it recommends uh, recreation being accessible to all and providing necessary integrated and accessible infrastructure. And once again, strategic land acquisition to improve park and trail connectivity. So as you can see from those three studies, all three of them uh, have the long-term goal of providing the opportunity for residents to continuously access the ac access the waterfront. Um, and then, uh, so next slide. Oh, there we go. Uh, sorry. Uh, so then, yeah, uh, Port Dalhousie, of course, um, it abuts the uh, Lake Ontario waterfront. Um, and so it has great heritage and is classified as a heritage district. Uh, the city has completed the Port Dalhousie Commercial Corps and Harbor Secondary Plan, as well as the Port Dalhousie Heritage Conservation District Plan. Uh, both these documents outline various recommendations for Port Dalhousie. Uh, the Port Dalhousie um, Her or, sorry, Heritage Plan also outlines that uh, the terminal point of road right-of-ways. Sorry, Kristen, can you go to the next slide? Um, yeah, so the, the heritage plan also outlines that terminal points of public road, road right-of-ways should be maintained as open viewing areas and that encroachments by private property owners are discouraged. So that does kind of, those are kind of the points that do come into play when we're looking at the waterfront uh, within Port Dalhousie. Um, and then uh, some additional uh, background studies that uh, provide some context for this master plan are the St. Catharines Climate Adaption Plan, which recommends that future designs take into account resiliency and higher lake levels. And then there is also the condition assessment and recommendations that were completed on the Port Dalhousie stairs uh, just last year. Uh, so next slide. So project context. So um, the purpose. So why this study is being uh, being done. So back in 2020, the city did commence emergency shoreline protection in the Abbey Muse area of Port Dalhousie, which resulted in the closure of the Macefield stairs due to this access not being safe for residents to further utilize the stairs. Uh, in addition, there are a number of staircases that provide access to the lake that are reaching their end of life. Um, Due to this, over the coming years, there will uh, there will be the need to reinstate public access to the waterfront. Uh, this exposed the need for strategic waterfront access planning to ensure that equitable access is provided across the St. Catharines shoreline. Uh, next slide, please. Um, 
So purpose. So from this, it was decided to complete this waterfront access master plan with the hopes of developing a strategic long-term plan for waterfront access along the entire Lake Ontario shoreline within the city's boundaries. Um, waterfront is an important public amenity. And as mentioned in the previous slides, there's many studies and plans completed by the city and region, which are being referred to when completing this master plan. Uh, in addition, the plan is also being informed by community and stakeholder engagement. And that is the, purpo uh, the purpose of this public information uh, center tonight. And I will pass it back to Kristen. Okay, thanks, Jocelyn. Um, this slide is really to show the, the project schedule and um, really note that we are currently in phase two. So the waterfront access evaluation, and then we'll move into phase three where the master plan will actually be developed. Um, Martina, was there anything you wanted to add on that slide? Just check in with you. No, just just that we are, yeah, just like you said, we're still in the early uh, phases and, and providing and uh, getting your input today on um, sort of where where we brought the project uh, up to date and kind of before we start actually doing uh, the reporting and development of the of the of the strategy itself. This is a really important check in with the community. So look forward to your feedback. Okay, thank you. And with that, um, we are looking to get some more input from you. Um, so we're going to go back to our Mentimeter polling. Um, so again, if you haven't had a chance, we are going to do this throughout the meeting. So I encourage you to um, participate. And I'll, we did end up having three people participate. So we had two people with frequently that they typically access the, the waterfront and one person often. If you are unable to join Mentimeter for whatever reason, you can add your answer into the chat so we can make sure we, re we record your, your feedback. But so we're gonna go through a few more questions. And the first question, and I'll start sharing my screen, is when you go, when you access the, the waterfront, um, and many people or the people on the call have noted it's either frequently or often. So you're, so you're getting to the waterfront often. How do you typically get there? So driving, public transit, um, cycling, walking, um, or, uh, or with the use of a mobility device? So I should mention um, when we're going to, we are going to be opening this Mentimeter up throughout the, the meeting today. So leave it open on your phone so you can keep uh, responding to the questions and don't have to go back to menti.com. I'll give it another moment here though, because I know there is someone else participating. And again, yeah, if you have any trouble, you can always, yeah. So I have a comment here that can't figure out Mentimeter, no problem, frequently walk or an occasionally drive. Thanks for that input. So we have a diversity of um, perspectives here on how, how people typically get to, to access the waterfront. And so we'll go to the next um, question. And that is, um, what do you typically access the waterfront for? So when you go there, what, what are you getting up to? So there's lots of options here. Um, you can select all that apply. And again, um, for those who cannot participate in the Mentimeter, please feel free to add your comments into the chat. So we have to use the beach, water related activities, exercise, lookout points for parks and playgrounds, uh, just enjoy the nature and, and the surroundings of the waterfront, organize events or other. So I'll give it a moment here for you to select kind of why you typically go to the waterfront. Okay, so we have people um, really appreciate the nature of the waterfront and to use the beach and then a lot of other reasons as well. So a variety here. And then from the chat to swim, enjoy, enjoy people 
enjoy watching people use the beach and enjoy looking at the water. Okay, so we'll go to the next question. And that is, um, overall, when you're thinking about getting to the waterfront, how would you rate the accessibility of the waterfront? And that really is the ability to access using your, your typical method. So if you identified um, that you typically draw, drove or used your bike, um, how what is the accessibility of the waterfront? So we have excellent, good, mediocre, and needs improvement. And also feel free to enter that in the chat as well. So far, we have good and mediocre. Let's give it a moment for, for others to respond as well. So mediocre with a, a slight lead there, um, access, which, which really leads us well to our next question, really, when we talk about the barriers to access. This is an open-ended question, but what are the barriers to your access to the waterfront currently? And you can feel free to use Mentimeter or the chat to provide your responses. We can give it a few moments here for, for you to you know, think about this and, and provide your response. So from the chat, we have pressure on parking um, at certain times, and then we have parking charges in Mentimeter as well. So park some parking issues. And I see we have um, some new attendees. So if you do want to join, we are doing some live polling. Um, and we'll be doing this throughout the meeting. So you can go to menti.com and there's a code in the chat. So if you scroll up, um, there's a code there, 65887664, menti.com. So we have some some parking challenges related um, to the barriers. And then we also have um, uh, one comment in the chat about being no barriers because um, they're able to walk and bike. Okay, with that, I'm going to um, flip it over back to the um, slide deck and hand it over to Jason to present um, some of the preliminary waterfront access analysis that has been done. Jason? Yeah, thanks, Kristen. Um, so in this uh, section here, uh, we uh, are gonna be sharing some of our preliminary mapping and analysis that uh, we will use to help inform the, the next stages uh, in this study. Uh, next slide, Kristen. So, um, St. Catherine has four primary waterfront access types that we are uh, examining. The beach, boat launch, lookout and stairs, uh, public beaches, either sand or cobble beach, which allow for safe and accessible direct access into the water's edge. Boat launches, public boat launches designated for motorized or non-motorized crafts into the Lake Ontario. Um, lookouts, uh, they are public amenities that offer clear vistas into Lake Ontario with no direct access to the water. Uh, they can be found along public trails and other spaces along with other amenities such as seating, lighting, and trash receptacles. Uh, the last access is the stair access. They offer public access uh, to the water's edge via staircase. They usually occur when there's significant topography and grade changes in, a, in an area. Next slide. 
this map shows the existing waterfront access locations along the St. Catharines waterfront that we are examining. Uh, additionally, it shows all public parks and city-owned lands across the waterfront. Next slide. Uh, this slide shows types the types of existing waterfront access along uh, the St. Catharines shoreline. Um, there are many locations where residents um, are able to enjoy the waterfront views. Um, some of the waterfront some waterfront access locations to point out are um, Sunset Beach and Lakeside Park Beach, uh, which offer um, direct access into the lake. Um, others uh, into the lake yet, yeah. and uh, there's other, there's also the two staircase access points in uh, Port de Luzi, um, Simcoe, uh, the Simcoe Street right of way, and Graham Avenue right of way. And we have comment in the in the chat, uh, which we will uh, bear st stairs removed from access at, uh, viewing points are overgrown and invasive weeds. Many points for stairs do not reach water, and we hope to go over uh, in the presentation. Uh, next slide. Um, so this slide shows uh, the topography. In along the waterfront, uh, St. Catharines is both unique to some other municipalities along Lake Ontario in that its waterfront landscape is characterized by its shoreline bluffs. Um, there is significant grade changes from the top of bank to the water's edge in most areas along the waterfront, which is a reason why areas including Port Dalhousie require infrastructure like staircases to get down to the water. Um, this isn't necessarily a bad characterization as the bluffs offer um, amazing views and vantage points that other locations may not have. Next slide. Um, in contrast, there are some areas with lower topography which may be more prone to flood due to the dynamics of Lake Ontario. Uh, these areas include Lakeside Park Beach and the marina um, and the area around Sunset Beach and Cherry Road Park, as well as the area around Jones Beach. Um, generally, there are continued efforts to protect the shoreline at um, various locations from floor flooding, uh, shoreline receding, and protection of assets, um, as well as overall shoreline resiliency. Next slide. Um, so looking back at all the waterfront access locations, um, St. Catharines waterfront is great in that there is a significant uh, parkland and city-owned lands along the waterfront. Uh, therefore, there are lots of opportunities to enhance uh, public access to the waterfront. Next slide. Uh, so this is the active transportation network um, along the St. Catharines waterfront. Uh, the waterfront has a great active transportation network um, and is accessible by trails and cycling paths within a 500 meter walk from the waterfront. Uh, this includes the Great Lakes Waterfront Trail and all the trails that connect to it. Um, there are There is lots of room for improvement um, in the trail system with future and potential trail connections along and to the waterfront shown as the dotted lines. Next slide. Uh, this map is the transit network, um, the existing transit network along the waterfront. Uh, the purple areas show a 500 meter walking distance from bus stops, which is typically a comfortable walking distance for most people. Uh, we can see that some areas, including Sunset Beach, Lakeside Park Beach, and Port Dalhousie, are well serviced. Um, there are service gaps currently, um, including some of the areas in. Uh, including east of the um, Waller Canal, um, and then the middle area between Cherry Road Park and Port, the Port Dalhousie Marina. And this is just the last slide before I hand it off to Martina to go over some of the preliminary findings. Um, 
the kind of the composite of all the layers of the tr active transportation and the transit network in relation to the existing waterfront access locations. And I'll hand it over to Martina. Thank you, Jason. So as, uh, as we look at uh, our preliminary findings, we wanted to highlight sort of the four key components because um, waterfronts uh, can be uh, in general accessing the waterfronts. There, there, it is sort of, there are complex infrastructures um, and park amenities and facilities and um, maintenance. It, it, is, it is actually, there's quite a bit involved from the city's perspective um, in order to uh, enable waterfront lands um, that are in public ownership and um, intended for use uh, for recreational use. So really what we recognize here is that City of St. Catharines, as my colleagues have uh, already uh, identified, it actually, when you look along the Lake Ontario, let's say if we stick to Lake Ontario uh, shoreline, it actually has a predominantly um, public facing, um, Already, it already has a public facing uh, kind of assets towards the water. And, and that's really unique. And that's something to already be proud of as we just look at first to start what what, what is the, the distribution and what is the actual percentage. It, it's really, really phenomenal to see. So um, your all the official plan um, policies and the work done that has been completed to date has gotten you here. So now as we look into the future, let's say into the next 10, 25, 30, 50 years, where where do you as a community, uh, where do you see the, where should the changes and the growth and the public investment be? So that's kind of where we're looking at that really there's an opportunity to secure these waterfront lands to improve the connectivity because there's only small gaps that uh, currently exists in the system. And for the most part, those are uh, parcels that are privately owned. So there are uh, particularly in Port um, a, a lot of that waterfront, the waterfront asset lands are privately owned, but it is looking for opportunities for, for you know, along the whole shoreline as redevelopment happens to try to secure those connections uh, for a, a cohesive and unified um, access throughout uh, um, St. Catherine's uh, shoreline. And, and then there are a few parcels that we've seen and that we identified in some of our mapping that are just sort of placeholders until the larger picture, the larger puzzle pieces come together. And that's a good part. Uh, that's one component of the of the uh, opportunity for continuous um, growth in the in the city's uh, assets. Uh, the challenge is that we don't know the timing. So there's market trends, there's the budget and, and other implications that, that put a bit of a, a, a challenge in, in making uh, sort of the, the actualization of the full strategy, but we're gonna take that into consideration and work with realistic timeframes uh, and prioritization of, of, uh, of the pieces and our recommendations as we move through the work. Um, we identified that there's also 12 public parks. Again, this is an amazing asset. This is fantastic. And through the consultations that we've done to date, um, this is something that um, the community uh, within the city and sometimes even uh, in outside of St. Catharines, there's destination spots and it's well loved. Um, but there and 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 there has been already a lot of work done on those uh, parks and there continue to be opportunities to update the facilities, the amenities and to improve the waterfront access. And some of the challenges similar is the timing of these updates, budget um, constraints, and then the maintenance costs. And, and so we're gonna look at those components through the strategic efforts. There are 11 uh, public right-of-way terminal, road right-of-way terminal areas. And they provide sort of the terminus in vista really into the lake. Um, and in some occasions, those vistas have also been um, um, in its sort of historic uses have been provided some secondary or, or an access point um, towards the lake or directly um, 
to the water. Um, and eight of those are located in Port Luzi as well. So there is an opportunity to improve the safety and accessibility. Um, and when we see accessibility, we're also thinking visual accessibility as well as physical. Um, and the challenges here really raw, um, are around sort of understanding where some of this infrastructure that exists, where where is it in its life cycle, and what are in, in future um, repairs, maintenance, uh, and uh, um, in general, um, better improved access type so that it is more accessible and it has the amenities that it needs to, there, there are some site constraints. So as we look at this, um, um, these uh, right of ways, we're assessing kind of the spatial components, how to make it safe for the public, is there a requirement for some parking, um, maybe lighting? And so these are some of the considerations that we're looking into and also identifying and, and being really um, strategic with where are the right locations. Because in some areas of the shoreline, there's really steep slopes. So what would that take? What would it take to do um, a new app? physical access into the water versus other locations. So there's a bit of a, a cost benefit analysis that will happen as well. And um, the, the last piece here is just that primarily as illustrated by my colleague, Jason, the active transportation routes are really um, well identified and supported. And there is a, um, an ongoing active transportation master plan that is underway. So we will continue to feed that new content into our work and to um, continue to, to identify if there's additional um, opportunities to make certain access points more, 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 um, um, accessible and and so maybe new new way new uh let's say bike routes or new um uh, trail systems might actually open up new um doors to other areas that may not have had access to or or um an equitable access to in the past so some of the challenges that we see there is that just historic development patterns and land ownership again sometimes provide a barrier to how um the community can access the water from plants. So some of the preliminary directions that we have here and uh, is really that the, the notion here is we want to connect all the key nodes with this continuous trail system um, that we will be looking to the possibility of, you know, what does it mean to have an all active transportation access, where the current routes of the city is maintaining, and how can there be improvements, and what does that look like in terms of the timeframes um, in the strategic uh, plan? Um, what does it mean to have fully accessible trails, park facilities, and amenities? And again, understanding kind of that threshold of um, universal accessibility versus just having access um, to maybe let's say visually to a space. Improving the lighting and safety is something we've heard through previous engagement sessions as well. It's really important. Um, short, opening up shoreline views and, and using our knowledge, knowledge of ecologic invasive species management and other techniques to really bolster the ecological um, integrity of the shoreline while also opening up views is really, really critical. Signage wayfinding we also heard, and we're going to look at, look at it as a key direction uh, to improve it so that it is a more cohesive system uh, and easy to navigate. And then the strengthening of the urban forest, and again, the ecological value is another direction we're exploring. So when we look at uh, the waterfront as a whole, what we are starting to um, sort of um, to sort of play with is this notion of how do we, how do we, um, and, and this is through, it's starting through our own uh, d sort of internal discussions and thinking, and I would like to present this to you and get your feedback on this today. And there will be time during our um, formal engagement uh, mural activity to provide input uh, through this and some engagement questions. But um, really what we're looking here is to say, well, th there's really a lot happening in St. Catherine's waterfront and it's really wonderful. And so how can we 
as a as a community? How can we look at the various um, destinations and different nodes of activities, and and try to uh, pro um, try to provide a framework that allows us to do a deeper dive and to do an evaluation? Because as previously discussed in some of the engagement sessions, we identified that not every access point along the waterfront will have the same, um, let's say, level of service and the kind of programming. And so, so there starts to be a bit of weaving of understanding of how different um, access points will have a different um, sort of function within the overall um, um, intent to have a more equitable um, waterfront access as a whole. So when we look at then sort of the first layer of that is this notion that we have waterfront destinations that are tourist attractions and are also uh, a place to that gets a larger visitor place, uh, a base, uh, pardon me, within the city itself, Lakeside Park Beach, Sunset Beach and Happy Rolfs Animal Farm. They have different programming. They there are uh, continuous improvements happen in the past, and upcoming improvements to some of the infrastructure and facilities, uh, and and park needs. So these are sort of the the key um, waterfront destinations that that um, we've already have seen as sort of a a determinant through some of the other um, consultations. So if we say that these are the three that are uh, the key destinations. Then we go to the next layer. Then there's an, an opportunity to also explore together what are some of the other community waterfront parks. So that's sort of uh, a secondary secondary level. They're still community parks. They still have a, a fairly wide sort of um, uh, cast of they cast of a wider net of of um, community users. Uh, and and potentially with some additional investment and um, park needs and what what does that waterfront access and water access look like in certain locations they could actually provide maybe some relief to some of the more the three core destinations um, and also provide maybe uh, a more equitable um, distribution of um, waterfront access. Um, um, in, in terms of the park setting. So then if we go to sort of the next node, as we build up this almost like an, a beaded necklace of, a, um, of the shoreline types in terms of the waterfront access. So then we start to look at the waterfront connection parks. And we understand that there are a lot, actually, a lot of beautiful, more passive parks um, within the city that that do provide more leisurely walks and the seating and and bird watching and 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 some of the more um, maybe nature based exploration of of the parks and those also start to weave in between the various um, assets of the city so those really could we could look at them um, as an investment in having that continuous trail, investment in opening up the strategic views um, and the through site development and maybe acquiring additional waterfront parcels as the opportunities come kind of in the more strategic long-term forecast that they actually also provide that um, the, the vision of a fully connected waterfront um, in St. Catharines. The next level that we look at are community water access. So again, knowing that because as mentioned, it's almost a 12 kilometer shoreline, there, there is something very beautiful about living close enough to walk, to cycle, to take the transit to a water, to a water um, access area. So we will be also looking and continuing to explore this with you where are the key strategic points uh, where um, where it makes sense to maybe reinstate or to develop uh, a new location for that direct access? And what would that look like? Would it be a ramp so that it provides a certain kind of access, a level of accessibility? Would it be stairs? Would it be uh, zipline? 
just joking. But, you know, it could be, it, it really is an exploration stage right now, but understanding that in some of these geographies that we um, have already presented, the, the, the bluffs are there, this is a constraint and also another um, component to consider in terms of cost. So uh, the last piece really that starts to then kind of fill in all of the pieces of that beaded necklace of your shoreline are the community waterfront vistas. And those th that is the visual connection and openings. Uh, there was a comment earlier about Ann Street and Bayview being completely overgrown and sunset is not vi visible. It's looking at locations such as that to really allow those vistas to be, like there is a reason why there is a bench uh, and that bench now sees a lot of overgrowth, but there, there would be some strategic actions and recommendations on where those air, where those clearings should should be maintained so that the, the community has that amenity and visual access. It's, it's really a passive, but really uh, important um, aspect of um, having waterfronting uh, lands and being a waterfronting uh, city. So really we, 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 we are sort of starting to look at these components at a high level. Uh, the, the bubbles or the necklace beads along here are, are kind of a bit vague because we want to have this discussion with you in terms of where, how do we help, how do we identify certain parks into which category? Because through this process, we will be looking at sort of, uh, recommendations and contributions to asset management, as well as an implementation plan. Where are the priorities? And when, if we can collectively um, find the right framework to through which to evaluate the existing access points and future access points, then that really puts us in a good position. So my, my last slide, I believe, is just evaluation matrix. And so through this process and after this consultation, um, we will gather uh, um, a complete list of the access points that exist and where the opportunities are and go through a really kind of um, thorough um, analysis with the various uh, uh, factors. So topography, you know, space for parking, space for different types of like understanding how the topographical changes will, what kind of infrastructure is needed for that. Um, washroom facilities, connections, vistas, and we'll try to kind of uh, uh, unravel all of it as a as a plan for strategic direction and the development of these access points. Okay, thank you, um, Jason and Martina, for that overview um, on some of the work that has been underway. Um, so now we're going to pause um, for about 10 minutes and we have time for questions. We do already have a question in the Q&A tab. You can put your questions into the chat or you can raise your hand as well. Um, I will go to the question um, that is in the Q&A first um, and give people some time to, to think about what questions they have as well. Um, there, there's a question here in, in the Q&A, probably for Jocelyn, um, about the Abbey Muse public staircase access and um, what is the status of reinstatement of that, that access? Uh, yeah, so city staff, we, yes, we realize it is a council priority um, and it is on our work plan. Um, we are working towards um, uh putting or getting getting that access back uh but that is also part um it is also part of this master plan uh integrated with that uh but uh we we do have some dfo commitments that we are still have that we are still uh trying to meet um in regards to that shoreline protection uh since it was emergency work um and so uh we uh once we get through all of that and then we will be uh working towards getting that access back thanks jocelyn thanks for the question just one second jocelyn is um can you define for the rest of us um dfo and, and what kind of commitments maybe just for sorry yeah so, that um, 
uh, so DFO is the um, the federal um, federal government, the uh, the fishery um, fisheries and oceans Canada. Uh, so as any time that we do shoreline protection, uh, we do have to get uh, approval from uh, DFO for that. Um, and so uh, they they handle everything in regards to um, fish habitat. And so we are uh, we we have to ensure that we're always uh, meeting the requirements that they do set out for all shoreline work. Okay, thank you for that uh, explainer, Jocelyn. Um, uh, just give it another moment here. If there's any questions, you can put them in the chat or raise your hand. Is there any questions of clarification on the, the information you just saw presented? Um, presented there on the context and, and policy background information and some of the preliminary work that's been done. There's a follow-up question here about the Abbey Muse staircase, but um, Jocelyn, I think you have already addressed that in that um, it is part of, of this master plan. So I don't think it, they, they're asking if it needs to be voted on again, but I, I don't think it does. That is part of your work plan. It, maybe I'll, I'll I'll take that question just to provide clarification there. The direction has been provided by council to staff. Staff have put that um, on their work plan uh, to carry out the work. Uh, don't believe it is going back to council for any further votes. Um, We've received the direction and we'll uh, we'll carry out the work accordingly. But as Jocelyn mentioned, um, we do have obligations uh, to the existing uh, permit for the shoreline protection that we need to complete um, uh, with regards to that original project. Um, but it is our work plan to have the stairs reinstated. Okay, thanks for adding that, Anthony. Okay, I'm not seeing any other hands up or questions in the chat. Um, oh, I do see now a question. Um, and I'll just remind you, if you do have a question that comes up after the end of this meeting, it's not just this one opportunity you have to engage, you can reach out after the, the meeting as well. Uh, so if you think of something later, don't hesitate to reach out. So there's a question here about um, major major waterfronts and waterfront areas like Lakeside Park, um, and if there's going to be more recreational facilities there. So um, some things like a water slide or rentable jet ski. So um, so what are like some of the amenities and facilities that could be at these that these major waterfront destinations? Um, because this this person notes that um, can be a draw drawback to these locations if there are net not any facilities. So maybe that question is for Martina um, about what kind of um, amenities and facilities could be envisioned for some of these areas. So uh, I think I'm going to actually redirect that to Eric um, because that is um, this particular waterfront access master plan is looking at um, access alone and not um, the other supporting, uh, which are I totally agree are really uh, critical in terms of um, the types of uh, programs that are that are draw people to these locations. So I'm just going to pass it over to. Eric. Yeah, hey, thank Aaron. you, Martina. Uh, yeah, thank you, Martina. Thank you for for the question. Um, the the city in the past few years and and kind of in the the short term future as well uh, has invested heavily into to both Lakeside Park and Sunset Beach as well. And so, uh, looking at, at Lakeside Park, uh, there was Canada 150 grant funding that uh, we were able to receive, and so uh, that looked at uh, new recreational infrastructure such as the band shelter. Uh, in with community partnerships as well, and the new pavilion there, uh, accessible walkways, uh, the Moby mats for accessibility from uh, the hard service connection down to the water's edge, 
uh, a sun shelter as well. Uh, just to name a, a few of the things, um, also investments into the washroom facilities uh, at that location as well, uh, making sure that there's uh, family washrooms uh, as well as accessible washrooms. So there's been uh, a lot of um, investment into the recreational aspect of Lakeside Park. It is also a highly permitted park uh, with events throughout the year. Um, so in terms of adding uh, additional hard uh, recreational facilities, I, I would say that Lakeside Park, for example, would be at capacity at the moment and there isn't much room for anything additional. Uh, there is the concession stand uh, in terms of looking for, you know, food options, as well as, uh, you know, the occasional rentals and things of that nature. But um, we also have the food trucks program, um, but Lakeside Park is ineligible, uh, but that would bring us over to uh, Sunset Beach. So this past year, we were able to have kayak rentals at Sunset Beach, again, following in that recreational uh, amenities type scale of things. And also, um, as hopefully everybody has heard, uh, there'll be about $6 million uh, worth of funding investments into Sunset Beach. Uh, and so we were fortunate enough to be recipients of a, a grant of $4.4 million towards Sunset Beach. And so that'll look at a total revitalization of the park. Uh, which would be in addition to the, the recently uh, built washroom structure there, which is uh, hopefully everybody's had a, a chance to see, but it's absolutely incredible. Uh, again, universal washrooms, family washrooms, uh, accessible facility, Moby mats uh, that bring you right from kind of the edge down to the water's edge. Um, so there'll be a lot of great investment into Sunset Beach as well. And again, um, really harping on uh, making it accessible, making it welcoming, uh, and really for a, a city where everybody can play. And so uh, in terms of investments into to our beaches, uh, definitely something that is a high priority for city staff and for council. Uh, and we hope to see some great things in the, in the future here at Sunset Beach and, uh, and really enjoy the things that have happened at Lakeside pa Park the last uh, decade or so. Hey, thanks for that information, Eric. Sounds exciting for Sunset Beach and, and Lakeside Park. Um, not seeing any further questions, so maybe we'll continue on and um, and there's going to be lots of other opportunities for input. So we will um, get on with the the final parts of the presentation and into the workshop component. Um, I think right now we will go back to Mentimeter. Um, so if you want to open up your Mentimeter, hopefully you still have that open. If you just joined us or haven't had a chance to, you can go to menti.com and there's an access code um, on the screen, but also in the chat. Um, and we'll go back to some of those questions, um, asking really for some feedback on some of the, the content, content you just saw presented. So I'm going to switch over to the live results. And again, if you can't participate through, if you're unable to participate through the Mentimeter, you can participate through the chat. Um, would love to have have your your input on these questions. So we have the first question up. It's how does the preliminary waterfront access framework make you feel? Um, and we have several options here: um, excited, great, neutral, worried, sad, other. So your kind of initial response to that, to seeing some of that that content. So I'll give it a moment to see if anyone else is going to join or or add to the chat. So we have some at neutral, one at great, one at excited. Okay, we'll go to the next question. So does the framework uh, represent the necessary changes towards a more sustainable, connected and equitable waterfront access? Yes, no, or maybe. So one yes, one maybe so far. So two yes, two maybe. So especially for those those maybe, there'll be lots of opportunity for input. So maybe you can help us um, move closer to that if you think there, there's 
more or a different thing that should be done. So next um, is, in your opinion, what are the key regional waterfront access destinations? And this is open-ended, so I'll give, um, give you some time here. So what are the key regional waterfront access destinations in St. Catharines? So we have Sunset Beach in Port Dalhousie, whole waterfront, Lock One, uh, Lakeside Park, and Sunset Beach in Port Dalhousie, um, if there's out of town visitors. I'll give it another moment here. Just to see if there's any final thoughts or, or comments. Um, some of you have already started to answer the next question, I think, but in your opinion, what are the key community waterfront parks um, in St. Catharines? We'll give it another moment here for, for folks to, to think about this and provide your responses. And again, if you are having any trouble, you can um, enter it into the chat as well. A couple of responses coming in. We have Spring Gardens Park and the access from Sunset Beach, uh, Lock One. We have Lakeside, Sunset, Rennie Park, Walk Along, Canal, Lock One. Okay, I'll give it another moment here again. You can use the chat or, um, or Menti to provide your responses. We have Rennie Park. A couple for that for that park as one of the key community waterfront parks. Okay, I'll go to the next slide. Um, so next one is what are the key um key waterfront connection parks? So what are those parks that provide um, those connections? We'll give it a moment here. Okay, we have Sunset Beach, Waterfront Trail um, that has the views along the water and canal and the bike trails.
So they all seem important depending on how and where you access them. Okay, we'll go to the next question. In your opinion, what are the key neighborhood water access points or places? So to get access to the water. I'll give it a moment here um, to allow people to respond. Um, so one person accesses the water um, at Sunset Beach. Let's see if others have other other uh, thoughts on that. Again, you can use the chat or Menti. Um, so we have Port Luzi Yacht Club. That's how they access the water. Okay, we'll go to our last question here is what are the key neighborhood waterfront waterfront vista points and places? So what are those like lookout spots that uh, that are key um, for local neighborhoods? We have Lake Street as a uh, Vista point um, that has been pointed out. And we can we can leave this open and maybe we'll get back to the presentation, but it will still be open if you still have responses to to share. So we'll get back to the presentation and we're going to go through, or I'm going to go through um, some of the engagement that we've done to date. Um, so our engagement um, approach was um, a, a website and information on the Engage STC site. So, so many of you may have already, already been to that site. Um, there was an online survey and a mapping survey in, in the summer. Um, there were community pop-ups primarily to build project awareness and encourage engagement. So um, city staff went out and, and spoke to, to community members directly. There were some stakeholder meetings as well um, and this public meeting um, today. So that those are the, the kind of avenues that have been have been taken in our engagement approach to date. And we do encourage you to stay involved through that Engage STC site. So there'll be updates on that site as we go through the final phases of the project. Um, so, so far we, we had quite a good response to the online survey with over 270 respondents. Um, we also had a mapping survey, and so that's where people could place pins um, on locations that they love, locations that need improvement. Um, and there were over 230 pins placed on that map that was live on the Engage site. Um, as I mentioned, there has been community um, Indigenous rights holder community outreach, so to Six Nations of the Grand River, Mississaugas of the Credit, Haudenosaunee Confederacy, Métis Nation of Ontario. 
And that consultation um, and outreach is ongoing and any feedback will be prioritized into the plan. And other feedback, I do wanna mention that we have received emails, the project team has received emails. So that um, also counts into the feedback that we are receiving on the, the master plan. So this is um, a, a highlight of some of the feedback that we've received through the stakeholder meetings, the online surveys, and comments, again, received through email. Um, so a few kind of common themes that have stuck out so far. So the importance of enhancing the environment and the natural beauty of the shoreline and improving those vistas and viewpoints. So that included, and I've seen it in the chat already today, that that some of that feedback included um, the maintenance of waterfront lookout points and landscaping um, to main maintenance um, and keeping it clean and also the preservation of biodiversity and the tree canopy in these areas as well. Um, so balancing all of that, um, ensuring accessibility and safety for all. So that included things like lightning, maintenance of pathways, um, access to public staircases. So that came up as well under this theme. Um, and I know it's come up to, uh, this evening as well, um, having lifeguards for, for safety on the water and dedicated bike lanes uh, along the waterfront as well. And that leads me to the, the third kind of theme that was about connectivity to and across the waterfront. So there's a lot of people uh, having a desire for a continuous trail along the waterfront. Um, and there was also um, some points about some areas that have a lack of transit access um, and accessible access points, as we saw through some of some of Jason's data that he presented. Um, people wanted to focus on providing amenities and facilities to support waterfront um, access points. So that was already mentioned tonight as well. Um, and that the, those things also included things like washroom facilities, benches, picnic tables, waste receptacles, um, and other features that would support the waterfront. Um, desire for more accessible um, access to enjoyable waterfront activities. And those things came up like paddle boarding and kayaking. And tonight we had um, other suggestions as well. So lots of ideas. Um, recommendations to improve transportation options to the waterfront, wayfinding and signage, the signage along and to the waterfront. Um, and also fostering an inclusive and enjoyable waterfront for residents and visitors, kind of an overall theme. Um, so I'll run through some of the, the survey data that we had. So um, the majority of respondents access the waterfront at least once per week. And we did um, notice that the majority of respondents to the survey live in those two wards that are um, that have access and are, are on Lake Ontario. 46% of respondents access the waterfront by driving and 41% accessed by walking. Um, the next um, slide shows that why people are accessing the waterfront. So the reasons why they're they're coming to the waterfront. Many suggested that it was to appreciate the nature, like like many of you tonight, um, to exercise or to use the beach. Um, were were followed that one that uh, appreciating nature. The most commonly accessed points from the survey respondents were uh, Lakeside Park Beach, followed by Sunset Beach and Happy Rolf's Animal Farm. Um, the next slide shows um, just that the same survey question we had tonight, that same Mentimeter question about how would people rate the overall accessibility of the waterfront, and 54% of respondents rated it as excellent or good, and then 46% rating um, the accessibility as mediocre or needing improvement, and that kind of shows kind of a split of perspectives that, that uh, people have. The last thing I want to note is some of that location specific feedback. So this was through the mapping survey. Um, and this was again, people had, you could put a pin on the map, hopefully you all participated. It is closed now, but um, people could pin what, what are future opportunities along the waterfront, what needs improvement and access points people really love. Um, there, there will be a full summary of the results um, that we will share on Engage STC soon. Um, but in summary, there was a lot of comments near Sunset Beach and Port de Luzi. Um, Cherry Road Park had quite a few needs improvement um, pins. Lakeside Park, um, there was some new amenities suggested like bike racks and, and cleaner washrooms. 
Um, there were a fair bit of, of love pins on Lakeside Park as well. Um, there was a couple of comments, or I think more than a couple of comments about connections between Port Dalhousie um, and Sunset Beach. So in, in proving those connections, and a lot of requests for new access points in the Port Dalhousie area, but also a lot of love for that area as well, along with um, um, the, the boardwalk there and the sunsets as well. Um, so lots of lots of positive comments and areas of, for improvement that we received. So now we are going to go um, another engagement moment we have is actually through uh, a platform that, that Martina already mentioned. It's called Mural. Um, it is a virtual whiteboard. So we are going to um, have some questions and and seek your input. Um, on on if we are missing any existing public access points um, and I help identify some of those opportunities and challenges along the Lake Ontario shoreline. I'm going to share my screen. You do not need to have access to the mural whiteboard. Um, you can either raise your hand or use the chat function to provide your input and to participate. Um, and we're going to go through three activities and I'll, I'll keep us moving along. Um, so I'll share, switch my screen now to the mural board, but again, you can participate through the chat and raised hands. Um, and the first thing I'm going to ask um, that you do is think about the access points that were shared with you in this presentation. And if there was anything missing as you saw us go, go through that. Um, so I'll scroll up to our first question. I'll just make it big here. Hopefully everyone can see it okay. Um, but really the, the question is, have we captured all of the existing public waterfront access points along the Lake Ontario shoreline? And um, so I do wanna be specific there and saying we are looking for access points along the Lake Ontario shoreline. Um, we have them identified in this image here. Um, but just want to pause here to see if if there's anything missing, any beach areas, boat launch areas, viewpoints, or staircases that we are missing on this map. From like your local experience and knowledge, want to see if there's anything that we have missed in our analysis. So I'll pause there. And again, you can raise your hand or um, or put it in the chat and we can put it on this, this board for you. We have a comment in the chat that nothing is missing that I am aware of. So yeah, really appreciate you providing that um, validation of this analysis. So thank you. Um, any other comments from our participants? So we have a comment here um, that a viewpoint is is uh, overgrown, um, but maybe that can be um, in our next question about opportunities. It's a good point though. I'll pause here for another moment to see if anyone has any other things, give you a chance to, to look at all the access points that are identified here. Um, there is a question in the Q&A, but I'm going to say that that could be, um, that's maybe a suggestion, an opportunity um, that we can maybe talk about in, in question three, unless um, someone from the city wants to address the capital budget to remove or to a maintenance 
to include maintenance, removing weeds and, and scrub brush. Maybe I'll take that just quickly, but we should definitely take that back. Um, we've heard that comment quite a bit uh, in the engagement that we've done is that uh, improved maintenance at some of the outlooks uh, because of the, the greenery that's grown. Obviously, we want to encourage um, we want to encourage uh, that you know continued growth of vegetation to ensure that our, our shorelines are, are as stable as possible. But um, that would not be a capital budget expense. That would be an operating budget expense uh, for the city. Um, so we would have to uh, um, increase the uh, level of service that we provide uh, with regards to the maintenance uh, in those areas. But definitely something that we should take back and uh, and address. Okay. Thanks, Anthony. Okay, I'm not seeing any other comments for this question. So we'll go to the next question. Um, and is this, this is, um, does this current level, does the current level of, of, of service um, meet your needs in accessing the waterfront? Um, so that um, is looking at the existing access points, like um, the amenities that are avail available, the types of access, Point. So if, if it's a park or a lookout, um, so does does it meet your 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 current needs? We could have like I think um, there was a comment in the chat about um, that overgrown the viewpoint at on Canal Street. So I'm guessing that is not. Um, meeting your your needs. So we can add that, I think, to this question in here. There was also another earlier comment, um, just scrolling up in the chat. Um, the lock stage at the second canal needs to have power and lighting, the ability to run concerts um, without the city impediment. So some lighting and power at lock stage at Second Canal. I'll take that one as well. Um, that That is already on the city's work plan. Um, and I, I don't believe it's something that uh, um, that is gonna be addressed through, through this master plan, thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, another point in the chat is about the, the stairs don't reach the water in Port de Luzi at many points. So um, wanting, I guess, more access to actual water from the staircase. Sorry, can you repeat that one? Um, that the stairs don't reach the, at the water in Port de Luzi at many points. Yeah, I think that's something that we'll take back and take a look and, and try to address that. But um, again, the shoreline is uh, changes with with the wave with wave action and erosion. So um, I think there's uh, there's room uh, for improvement there. It's something that we'll we'll look at uh, through the through uh, through the master plan and through we through, um, when we continue with that capital works. Okay. Thanks, Anthony. Okay, I'll give it another moment here, otherwise we can move to our next question. We've captured everything on the, the whiteboard here. Okay, so we'll go to our third question. There's really two parts um, of this question. Okay, so this third question is um, looking for that opportunities and challenges. Um, so what are opportunities that could increase accessibility at these access points? Um, and can you think of any challenges at each point that could make this difficult? So any location specific challenges um, that would make accessibility uh, more, more difficult? 
So we have in the chat more benches, but maybe um, if you want to get more specific on specific locations where you think there should be more, more benches. And Jason, yeah, asked the same question in the chat. Are there particular areas where more benches are needed? Maybe leave that one for Eric, um, but it's something that we can look at um, through our bench program. Yeah, and there was, there was another question or another comment in here about um, uh, vegetation removal. I think probably more um, um, that's maintenance that's falling into that operating budget piece again. So I think we've captured it there. Um, there have been a few locations specifically mentioned in the chat and Q&A, but if anyone has any other specific locations, I think Ann Street and Bayview Lookout, um, I think there was some some other ones here, uh, Canal Street. And I could probably quickly add as, as we're adding some things here that um, waterfront locations for the Memorial Bench Program are currently ineligible uh, as we have reached our capacity. So just for clarification for the group. Okay, thank you, Eric. So we have another comment in the chat that Elgin Street is currently overgrown as well. We'll give it some time here as well. So any other opportunities to increase accessibility at these access points? We have um, maintenance and more benches, um, which some people um, may may not agree with. Um, anything else on how to increase accessibility? We have some uh, further comment about the benches that I have no specific area that needs benches. I think the city does great. Okay, any other additional challenges at each point that you can think of? The challenges that can make um, increasing accessibility more difficult. Could be anything from transportation, signage, um, vegetation, uh, any, any challenges that come to mind. So we have one here about height of the bank. Give it another moment to see if anyone has any other thoughts about this. Otherwise, we can um, move back to our presentation. And we may um, wrap up early this evening um, if there are no further further comments or, or input that anyone wanted to provide. Any other opportunities or challenges? I'll give it another minute. some great uh, comments already. Okay, so there is a comment here. Um, 
probably a challenge that um, sounds like some people are making their own stairs with some dirt stairs um, just to, so they used a, the dirt stairs just past a creek to go up the bluff into the park. And sometimes um, they worry that this practice would damage the bluff. So um, some of those, those kind of informal pathways Okay, I'm going to go back to the presentation. I'm not seeing any other hands up or any other comments in the chat. Um, so we will go back to the slide deck um, and uh, wrap up with some next steps. Um, Martina, did you want to speak again to this slide about the the present about the the next steps in the project schedule? Sure. So we are, we, um, as noted earlier in the meeting, we are looking uh, for this feedback. I believe that this will be posted on the city's website. So if there's additional comments and um, as that you think of, um, please use uh, the Jocelyn's email and contact information that will be provided at the end of the slides um, to send additional thoughts and feedback. We will be looking for that in the next couple of weeks. Um, and then we are formalizing um, sort of the, the phase one listening and learning and the evaluation stages. And we hope to have the waterfront access master plan um, in, in draft in early November um, and, um, and then uh, to finalize it and present it in council, to council early next year is the plan. Okay, thank you, Martina. Um, really just want to pause here and reflect. So we heard a lot of input today, lots of great feedback on uh, maintenance of access points. So keeping um, those areas maintained so, so people can enjoy the lookouts and access points to the waterfront, um, including landscaping and access to staircases. Um, we heard about parking challenges in the area and other challenges along the waterfront, including the, the bluffs and, and the height. Um, difference and, and the challenge there and, and providing ac access. Um, heard opportunities um, around um, amenities and facilities to support the, the waterfront activity activities in areas um, and lots of other great comments. So really appreciate everyone's time this evening um, and your input, and we really appreciate it as we move into our, our next phase, this input is really important to inform that work. Um, so with that, maybe I'll just um, hand it over to Jocelyn to see if you have anything else you wanted to add, any reflections on the meeting today. Um, but again, thank you everyone for attending and um, it was a pleasure to be with you this evening. Jocelyn? Yeah, I just want to, uh, yeah, repeat, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed this presentation and uh, you found the information valuable. Um, yeah, so uh, the city and Dylan consulting, we will be taking um, all this information back um, and using it to develop the master plan. Um, and yeah, as was mentioned before, if there's any further comments or questions that anyone has, uh, please don't hesitate to uh, email me. Um, my email address is there. Uh, there's also um, a direct link on the um, on this Projects Engage STC website. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, there's a link to my email address there. So yeah, um, I would just like to thank everyone again. Okay, thanks everyone. Have a good evening.